Good morning. My name is Colin Cargill and I'm your worship leader this morning. So welcome to Moriarty Uniting Church. We are very pleased to be able to share this time with you. A very special welcome to you if you will be viewing this service at a later time. You are very much part of our extended family and we give you a very warm welcome. I would now like to ask Dawn to light the candle, please. We light this candle to remind us that the light of the crucified risen Christ shines in us as the people of God and identifies us as the children of light. We recognise that we worship on lands of the Ghana clan of the Adelaide Plains, with the original custodians of this country. We seek to honour their ancient wisdom and pledge to support all steps to recognise them as the first peoples of our nation. Our call to worship this morning. God is loving and the truth, beyond all truths. His word excels all human wisdom. Source of joy, higher than all delight and happiness. His glory is greater than the light of a stars. You are nearer than our thoughts. We trust you, we worship you, we adore you. Now, first hymn this morning is from Together in Song 143 Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
Let us pray our prayer of forgiveness together. God of all that is. Friends, the words Jesus heard at his baptism are God's words to us. You are my beloved. Therefore, our self-centeredness and myriad shortcomings are not held against us. We are set free by God's infinite mercy. And I'd now like to invite you to share the peace of shalom with each other. I'd invite you all to return to your seat and we will continue singing the next hymn from Together in Song, 699, A New Commandment. As you may already know, Casey and myself have been inspired to campaign against children in detention. A few weeks ago, we collected teddy bears, which we are going to deliver to Christopher Pine's office next week. Today, we would like to tell you a bit more about why we have started this campaign and what we have learnt so far. Jordan and Casey, why is it wrong for, for kids to be in detention centres? Detention centres in Australia hold over 300 teachers children, which in our minds is over 300 too many. Detention centres don't have suitable facilities like decent schools and proper health facilities. It is also unfair for children to be put under the kind of strain and mental pressure that happens in a detention centre. Many children have been damaged mentally by their time in a detention centre and once mental damage has been done, it is almost always irreversible. What was it? in the sermon that you heard that you found inspiring? We were inspired by the fact that people are already taking action to stop children entering detention centres and we both wanted to join the campaign against children in detention centres. Why do you think it's a good thing to deliver teddy bears to Christopher Pine's office? It tells Christopher Pine that we think it's a bad idea having children in detention centres and that he should reconsider his ideas of keeping children locked up. And for those who perhaps don't know, Christopher Pine is our local member, is that right? Why would being a Christian or a follower of Jesus make you want to support refugees? 
Christianity teaches us that every person matters and every child deserves a chance at a good life. For a good life to begin, a good start is a necessity. Um, thank you for the teddy bears you have all provided to us and thank you for supporting us in this campaign. And thank you, Casey and Jordan, for sharing that with us. Thank you. Have you ever failed at anything or had a sense of failure? You know, I was the kind of kid when I was at school, when we had running races, I always came last. Or the one who was, you know, when they picked sides, as they always did in the playground school I went to, all boys, you know, you get picked last, oh, we'll have him. So, have you felt like you've ever failed? What does it mean when you feel like that? Try harder? Make sure you do better next time? Well, there was a bishop in the late 19th century who pronounced from his pulpit and through his journal that was widely read in the district, in the, in the church, in the wider community, that, he, that heavier than air machines Heavy and air flight was both impossible and against the will of God. Well, Bishop Wright had two sons, <laughs> Orville and Wilbur. <laughs> and on the 17th of December 1902, they were the first to pilot a heavier than air machine that they called an aeroplane. But only because after so many tries, they persisted and tried harder. Right, the bishop father was wrong, sure of himself, but wrong. Sometimes when we fail, we may best simply say, accept it. And say to yourself, yes, it hurts to fail, but I'm not going to let my failures rule me. I can move on. Or you might say, I have every good reason to try harder. We're going to have a reading today about what it means to try harder, to what it means to persist a story about not giving up. It will be our gospel reading. Thank you. Our first reading today is from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. The parable of the widow and the unjust judge. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said... In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Our second reading is from Jeremiah 31, verses 27 to 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with seed of humans and seed of animals. And just as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy and bring evil, so I will watch over them 
to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But all shall die for their own sins. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. In this is the word of the Lord. Our third reading is Psalm 119, verses 97 to 104. And this reading is an interpretation of the psalm. I invite you to join with me in this reading. I will read the first part in each section, and then you can read the second part. The projection will help you with this. Lord Jesus, how I love your gospel. It stays with me all day long. You make me wiser than my enemies, for your arrows never wear out. I am better off than those who lecture me, because you live in my thoughts. Because I follow you all the way, I am understanding beyond my years. I stop from rushing down evil paths as I concentrate on your word. Your words are sweet on my tongue, sweeter than gum blossom honey. In your parables I see the light and <coughs> Now let us sing together the hymn, Seek, O Seek the Lord, together in song number 464. Please note, Katrina will sing the chorus first and then we will sing the chorus also. Then Katrina will sing the verses and we will join her in singing the chorus. Please remain seated while we sing this song.
speak to him in prayer and he will hear. When I was young, I began my life in the church with great expectations. I believed I was going to participate in a great venture. Now that was encouraged because our youth director, Peter Matthews, had a, a charismatic flair and lifted the sights of what it meant to be disciples of Jesus. But it was also the time in the 50s that the World Council of Churches had come into being and we had great hopes for the church. Uh, the figure there of John R. Mott, Mott taken, obviously, in his younger days, of course, he had this great slogan, the evangelization of the world in our lifetime. Can you imagine that in the beginning of the 20th century? There was that kind of optimism. And Mott, who was a lay person, was one of perhaps the founding fathers of the ecumenical movement of the 20th century. He and, of course, as many others. I believe that the church had something unique to contribute to the civilizing process. That peace and justice would prevail in our world after the Second World War. Were these expectations that one would hold on to, even if they were not fulfilled? Let's go back to the early church for a time. Some in the early church expected that the kingdom of God would come quickly. There was no point worrying too much about the things of this world. You could dispose of your possessions because they really won't be needed. The end time would soon arrive. But waiting for this end time seemed to get longer and longer. The end of the first century came. Was it going to be the end time then? No, but the Christians uh, were beginning to grow throughout, the, uh, throughout the, the Roman Empire. That was good. Was this promise of the end time ever going to be fulfilled? And some people lost hope. I mean, at the end of the second century, yes, the Christi Christianity has spread widely through the, the Roman Empire, but had to face much and much extreme persecution. Some people lost hope. Their expectations weren't filled, fulfilled. Others went off to other paths, became apostates. Many withdrew and waited in caves and watched the collapse of civilization. And occasionally they would send out a messenger. And the messenger would come back and people would say, has the Lord come yet? And they said, no. It's getting worse out there. Eventually, however, there were those who began to take a different view. Someone, one of these people, messengers, went out and came back and said, you know, I'm wondering whether we've got it right here in these caves in retreat. Maybe the Lord is already out there. And so they got out of their caves. And as the Roman Empire collapsed, the church was the only credible organisation left in society. The church was there to rebuild Western civilization. And do you know what? That throughout the whole of Europe, every town had a church in the centre, or if you were big enough, a cathedral. I think what had happened is that they remembered different words of Jesus. The kingdom has arrived. The kingdom is within you. It is now. God's purpose is to be worked out in the historical process. That's probably the background to our reading from the gospel today. It's a parable addressed to those whose expectations are not being met. A woman needed justice to be done. The problem was that she had to, had to deal with a flawed system. And no one was listening. 
perhaps if we translated what was being said, it, it really should be something like this. We heard this at the uh, early service this morning in the King James Version. Uh, and so this is some, something of a contrast. Hear what that sleazeball of a judge says. Though I don't give a tinker's cuss for God or man, because this woman keeps getting up my nose, I'll rule in her favour, otherwise she'll be giving me ulcers with her constant nagging. <laughs> and the parable makes a contrast with God here. If a sleazeball like this judge will come to help a persistent woman, how much more will God speedily come to the help of his people? But then Jesus said, persist. Persist in prayer. Don't be discouraged. Keep faith. Now, friends, we all experience times in life when life and faith and the church don't match our expectations. I think I've heard it several times over the years where someone says to me, oh, I don't get anything out of church anymore. Or I put all this effort in. Is it worth it? Well, if our expectations are not met, there are two possible reasons. The first is we have false or unreal expectations. Now, some may assume that things will always go right for us if they're diligent in their faith and its practices. We had a young family back in the days when uh, we were in Wyala in our congregation that met in the school out in uh, Wyala Stewart. And this Chinese family moved to, um, to Queensland. I think it was Charleville or someplace like that. They discovered life was not quite as easy out there. There was more racism than they'd ever thought they'd expected, but they learned to live with that. But then, their chemist shop burnt down. And they were bereft because they were kind of still newish as Christians and had this expectation that if you were diligent in your faith, the Lord would look after you. And they expected to be successful in business. Well, you know, life can be so unfair. We all struggle with this at times, the contingent, the unexpected realities of life. The psalmists in particular express this feeling so often. I think many of the psalm is really saying, are you listening, God? Are you really there? Just as we would cry out when things don't work out as we would have them expect. There comes that moment for all of us. And it's not unlike the sound of I call it sheer silence that Elijah experienced. He went to a cave to hide because things weren't working out. He expected God to work his way in the miraculous, the fire, the winds, the storm, etc., in some kind of spectacular way. But no, he discovered within him the reality of God was there. The still, still small voice, or the, some say the sound of sheer silence, but that sheer silence spoke to him. I, Elijah, get back out there. Persist again and try again. There will be other ways. Live in the world of earthquakes and chaos that's out of control out there. But look again, there is another way. And I am still with you, the presence of the Lord. So we can have false expectations when things don't work out the way we want them. Or we can be just overly romantic. How often have I come across people who are romantic about what, it like, what it's like to live in community? Bonhoeffer says in his great little treatise on community, but God does not let us live in a dream world. We have to deal with real people, with real foibles, who will upset us and stir us, and we'll think they're wrong and we'll think they're wrong. But this is a community of grace. We are all sinners. But the community of grace means that we're also f forgiven. So don't get too carried away with unreal expectations of lovable community. 
we will discover the kind of love that allows us to live with real people if we persist. Or, I won't elaborate this last one, there's that expectation of always living with an emotional high. And sometimes a new Christian is so ecstatic at having discovered how profoundly that they're loved that it kind of sends them into a whirlpool, whirlpool of almost a... No, whirlpool is not the right word, but that kind of sense, that sense of ecstasy. And they think it's going to continue forever, and it doesn't. And when it doesn't, they feel let down when they have to deal with the nitty-gritty of the everyday. These are just uh, some samples of the unreal expectations that reality, whose name sometimes is God, eventually forces us to reject. And, you know, behind all this really are sometimes our limited pictures of God. Only by life experience is God revealed to us as much bigger than we first thought. So, either we can have expectations that are false or unreal, but then secondly, we can have perfectly legitimate expectations but are as yet unfulfilled. Similar to the early church. But not fulfilled perhaps in the ways we first expect. I mean, I think of some of these in my lifetime. The expectation that we would have renewed the church by the year 2007. Now I ask you, what year is this? (laughs) The expectation that fundamentalist fundamentalist forms of faith would just disappear off the face of the earth. Well, what's happened? They seem to have grown, both in the Christian and the Islamic world. Or that local congregations will truly turn outwards to see themselves as living for the sake of the world out there. Yes, sometimes fulfilled and unfortunately often not. Or the expectation that indigenous people would express their dream of being self-sustaining communities. Or the expectation that racism born of British superiority would absolutely disappear. Well, I won't mention any names in our Senate. So what do you do when legitimate expectations are not fulfilled? Jesus says, don't lose heart. How do we not lose heart, Jesus? Persist and pray. Persistence always means remaining active, like the widow. And I like the way Bob Douglas did his, uh, uh, his session, his workshop with us last Saturday week. Yes, he painted this rather stark possibility of the extinction of life on the planet. But then he kind of called us oldies. He said, you old people, don't you give up. You might be the ones who will be in the forefront of being about the bit of that kind of transformation that has to happen in our society, in the world, where we apply all the technologies we can to combat the climate change realities. He had that call to remain positive in the face of what seems so hard and difficult. If you believe your cause is right, Only time will prove it to be so as long as you persist. Proved precisely because you believed and persisted. It's happened, by the way, in history. Think what happened in South Africa. I never believed that apartheid would eventually be overcome. But then I think we have to remember here what I call, I think, is the essence of prayer. Prayer sometimes isn't just all for the little nitty-gritty things. Prayer is like, I call it, deep resolve. That means being prepared to struggle with hard decisions. And even in the Bible, we have this strange notion that in the struggle, that even the mind of God can be changed. That was behind the story of Jacob struggling with the angel. That picture, by the way, is, is that symbolically. 
Or I remember what I learned in Sunday school. There are three answers to prayer. Do you know what they are? Yes, no, and wait. That's it. Yes, no, and wait. And in this waiting and this persisting and this struggle, trust the fact that God never abandons you, even though God may seem not to be there as you expect from God. We see this most clearly in Jesus. His prayers were prayers of deep resolve. Jesus was not led off the struggle to discern the will of God. You think of the story of the Garden of Gethsemane and what was really going on there. Don't despair having to make tough decisions. Jesus did not give up when his disciples, they all were almost, they were failures. A failure to all. Do not give up because your cause is unjust or unpopular. Jesus took the risk of a trusting that a self-sacrifice, a giving of yourself, and of course it did lead for crucifixion for him, would evoke a response from God. If you give yourself, there will be a response in history, a response from God. This, for me, is the profound meaning of drinking from the sacramental cup. And so who has taken the risk here? Was it not God who risked counting on Jesus to go all the way? And he did. Jesus, if anything, was himself like the persistent widow. And I wonder, does God count on us? Surely we are counted on. That's probably the meaning of that throwaway line, will the Son of Man find faith on earth when he comes? So, friends, is it not both ways? For us to count on the promises of God, especially that we are not abandoned ever as his beloved child, especially that profound love is the way, the truth, and the life, to count on the promises of God, and that God is the one, the one who is love also counts on us. Persist. Don't ever give up. And we shall sing the next hymn.
offering for our work in this place and beyond will now be collected. God of justice and mercy, we bring our offerings to you. We pray that the work of your church may be enlarged, enriched and strengthened as it seeks to show justice and mercy in our world of need. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray the prayers for the people. God of all people and all nations, may we have the courage to be like the persistent widow, to persist and never cease in our pursuit of justice for all humanity and all creation. Let us dedicate ourselves to the ministry of peacemaking. Let us commit to loving our friends and our enemies and working to be reconciled with those we mistrust and those who do not share our culture or lifestyle. Let us denounce war as a final rupture of the human family and seek the security that comes when we live in a just society. Let us dedicate ourselves to sharing our country with others. Let us continue to open our doors to those in need of our help and protection and not to be stubborn and self-seeking. Let us dedicate ourselves to the ministry of caring for the creation, to be good stewards, and work to sustain our ecosystems, not ravage and destroy the delicate fabric of the world that sustains us. May we have the honesty to question and take stock of how we live and to seek to be more passionate about sharing our resources, our talents and our wealth. This morning we remember those in, we remember in silence those who are sad, those who suffer, those who are sick, and those who are lost or lonely. We also remember in silence those sitting next to us, behind us, in front of us, our friends and members of our family, and those who are special in our lives.
Let us dedicate ourselves to not only building bridges with our Christian sisters and brothers, but our sisters and brothers of other faiths and those who have lost or are yet to find their faith or travel alone. We now pray the prayer of Jesus. And our final hymn for this morning is from Together in Song 779. May the feet of God walk with you. days of strong faith, may we serve God joyfully. In days of faltering faith, may we serve God courageously. In times of happiness, may we reflect God's smile. In times of grief, may we feel God's tears. In the midst of failure, may we trust God's mercy. In the midst of success, may we give God praise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen.